So good evening once again. Uh, and uh, for those who are in a different time zone, uh, hello and welcome to our Kenya Society of Anesthesiologists uh, CME, our weekly CME for today. Uh, we would like to start, I can see we are more than 100 participants. And today we are privileged to discuss a topic that has been a question of research for the last probably uh, about 10 years. And we shall have experts in pediatric anesthesia discussing this. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, the presenter and the panelists uh, so that we can move on. So before I do that, uh, just some housekeeping, uh, kindly ensure that uh, you are muted, although we can do that centrally. And then two, if you have any com uh, comments as we go on, you can put your questions on the chat and I will pick them up. Uh, or if you want to make a comment by speaking at the end, you will raise your hand and we'll pick you out uh, after the presentation. So we shall have uh, a presentation by Dr. Karen Bayer, then we'll have a panelist discussion uh, followed by a, a small presentation from our sponsors for today. So I'll start by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Dr. Susan Nabulinda. I'm a pediatric anesthesiologist, but today I will be your moderator for the session. I also double as the secretary of the Kenya Society for Anesthesiologists. Uh, welcome all. Uh, our presenter today on the topic of effects of anesthetics on the growing brain is uh, Dr. Karen Bayer. Dr. Karen Bayer is a pediatric anesthesiologist at the Aga Khan Hospital, Mombasa, one of the large uh, private hospitals in our country. Uh, she has been uh, practicing pediatric anesthesia for the last five years, and she says she's passionate for patients in obstetric anesthesia and pediatric anesthesia. She uh, an avid storyteller. So I believe one day she shall, uh, she, she's going to write a book about pediatric anesthesia where she practices. So thank you, Dr. Karen, and uh, welcome. Uh, with the panelists, we have Dr. Rebecca Gray. Dr. Rebecca Gray is a friend of the Kenya Society of Anesthesiologists, a pediatric anesthesiologist practicing at the Red Cross uh, War Memorial Children's Hospital in South Africa. Uh, she has been practicing a pediatric anesthesia for the last 13 years. And she is also um, very passionate about training, especially through simulation. And she puts efforts in trying to see that we have increasing uh, access to pediatric anesthesia in Africa. And lastly, we have uh, Dr. Zipora Gaduya, who is also a long practice pediatric anesthesiologist in Kenya, among the pioneer pediatric anesthesiologists in this country. Uh, she will be joining us shortly. Uh, she also also very passionate about neonatal anesthesia and now involved in uh, outreach missions to try and spread the skills and, and uh, knowledge of pediatric anesthesia all over Africa. So thank you very much and uh, we hope that you enjoy this session. Dr. Karen Bayer, uh, we'd invite you to share your slides so that we proceed. Hello. Yes, you can go ahead. We can you hear can you. You can hear me? Yes. I feel like saying good evening, viewers. Um, <laughs> Thank you very much for this opportunity and thank you for joining us um, in discussing this um, disturbing topic in the anesthetic world, in the parenting world, in the surgical world. Uh, though I don't know whether surgeons get disturbed by such things, but uh, especially in the parental world. So the year is 2020. 
In this century, in the last 20 years, anesthesia has grown in leaps and bounds. Medicine has grown in leaps and bounds and advances in periop care and imaging and surgery has necessitated that anesthesia has to grow uh, almost at twice the speed because we have to provide this service. So whereas there was only X-ray and CT scans and CT scans were few and scattered and far between in the 80s. Come from 2010, it's been a bit more white. I, I guess like in Kenya, we have every county hospital has a CT scan and every I think has an MRI unit. Uh, we have surgeons going all over. We are not letting our children grow up with hernias, grow up with their congenital problems. We have a uh, talipes. We have all these problems that have solutions, surgical solutions. And that's where the anesthetist comes in. So what does uh, anesthesia? Anesthesia has been defined broadly as the practice of medicine providing insensibility to pain during surgical, obstetric, therapeutic, and diagnostic procedures. Further to that, uh, it has also been defined as a complex pharmacological response produced by heterogeneous class of drugs involving mechanisms on specific neuronal complexes, networks in different regions of the CNS. So to speak, as we define ourselves, we try and give a mix of drugs and agents to produce sleep, to produce insensibility, to produce a, a pain-free patient, and sometimes amnesia, depending on what we're doing, what case we're doing, what procedure we're doing. So, a lot of times we are asked about the side effects of the anesthetic agent we're given. And today we are not going to discuss the aspiration, the spasms of the airway, the desaturation, that which uh, scares parents the most, the death, the parents come in and being told the patient is no more. No. We're going to discuss something more subtle and long lasting that after the patient has woken up and you're called in to kick your child, the question is, so now what? Will she be okay tomorrow or will she start bedwetting? Will she be, when she goes back to school, will she be five levels lower than where she was in the previous term? And then, as if we didn't have enough problems with the parents, the FDA goes ahead and labels, gives us a, a warning, a label warning that tells the parents to beware of the anesthetist. Yeah, my slide is not. So do all babies need a hypnotic agent for that procedure? Where hypnotic agent comes to be the ketamine, the midazolam the sevoflurane, the enflurane, the isoflurane. Uh, just in the 80s and the 70s, from what I hear, anesthesia for neonates was only nitrous, oxygen, and paralytics. Because as of that time, they had the same fear we have in now, that there'll be an untoward side effect of anesthetic agents. Further to that, there was the thinking that children do not feel it, especially then in the 1980s, this, this drove a lot of um, concern regarding the safety of general anesthesia in young children. And in the 1980s, several landmark studies were done in the Netherlands, Denmark, in US, in Canada, in Australia. I guess in Africa, we were still not there because we tend to lag a bit behind most of these things. And they demonstrated that this practice was inadequate and in fact associated with increased stress response, hemodynamic instability, and poorer outcomes. Um, anesthetic te techniques were therefore changed. Now, we all know that analgesia is critical. It's critical to prevent altered brain processing, to prevent suffering. They get a behavioral and cognitive dysfunction to stop. And that is why, actually, for most reason, we have even minor procedures, which I'll put in quotes, minor procedures in children done under uh, anesthetic presence. So if, but the question comes, if adequate analgesia, if pain relief is what we are seeking, 
why then do we need to give a hypnotic? Why then do we need to make the child sleep? Right? We need to go through the whole process. So let's talk about the baby brains. Neonates are born with, a, with approximately 100 billion neurons. And this does not increase over time. Their brains are small. They're about 300 to 400 grams. Uh, in the course of the first three years, they have increased myelination, they have synapse formation, they have neural maturation, proliferation of glial cells, and this is what increases the weight of the brain up to around 1,100 grams and to a maximum of 1,300 grams in adulthood. As you notice, the first three years are very critical because that's when this little brain from 300 grams to 1,100 grams, and then up to now as an adult, you only gained 200, 300 grams from when you were about two years of age. So during this time, the brain is very sensitive to insults. You, the brain is very sensitive to the stimuli and that's why a child, um, as a child is developing, you have to give it stimulation that will form it as they grow up. During normal development, neurons are produced in excess by as much as 50 to 70 percent. And subsequently, there's neuronal pruning, which is apoptosis, that is programmed cell death. That happens. And uh, by three years, the brain has, the neurons have come back to about um, 50 percent of those neurons that were there. Um, and then how do our drugs work? We all know uh, most here anesthetists, they, they act by reducing the activity in the brain. How do we do that? We reduce the GABA, we increase GABA activity, we have GABA glutamate. We increase GABA activity, that's inhibitory. Then we reduce excitation. In summary, that's mostly what we do. So on the table, uh, there, you see the benzodiazepines, um, isoflurane, sevoflurane, all work on the GABA, they are GABA agonists. NMDA antagonists, this one's reduced excitation. The best one of them all, the nitrous. Other ways we try to induce anesthesia and other ways and other receptors that they work on are the ion channels, the opioid receptors, the alpha-2 receptors, the 5-HT receptors, and many other. They can't be said to work on exactly one or two. So that's how our drugs work. And then we find that glutamate, which is the excitatory neurotransmitter, has action on MDA receptors and causes trophic, has trophic functions in the developing brain. This encourages the cell growth, we're talking about cell migration and synapse formation. GABA, which is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, but in the nervous system development has excitatory properties. So GABA heavily influences brain development, differentiation, growth rate, and synapse formation. Under normal circumstances, GABA activation, that is inhibiting the CNS activity, triggers action potentials and influx of calcium. With this potentiation, the receptor may become overactivated and experience an overwhelming influx of calcium and result in apoptosis. Apoptosis is that program cell death. So these agents have been found to block the synthesis of the neurotrophic agents, that's the glutamate, and enhance synthesis of factors that are death receptor agonists causing apoptosis. This mechanism of anesthesia induced cell death is not really fully understood. So there's the question of, does it encourage cell death of those ones which are still going to die or does it cause premature cell death? Um, this is a, a schematic figure of um, the effects of volatile anesthetics. Uh, I've only used volatile anesthetic because that's what we mostly use, but also um, there's been some extrapolation with propofol and ketamine. So, will we give it or not? We should give opioid only uh, anesthetic. 
there was, uh, after all this talk about apoptosis, causing cell death, causing learning disability, uh, causing memory problems, and then there's so many animal studies that showed that the memory lapses in neonatal rats after getting anesthesia. Um, of, there was one that was showing after an anesthetic, getting volatile anesthesia for about six hours, the neonatal rat, up to when it was an adult, could not find its way back home. Home means that maze um, of tunnels that uh, its age mates who had not received anesthesia could find their way back home, in quotes. And then several other animal studies. Of course, these animal studies, they, they give super, super doses, super doses of these anesthetic agents, but it revealed retrogression of milestones in the animals, um, confusion in these animals, that they were never normal again. Um, so this drove a lot of curiosity on what's, what's happening with the little ones, the little humans, with the little humans that were getting a, a anesthesia, especially in the 80s and the 90s. And lots of cohort studies were driven around that time, especially in Canada, Netherlands, New York. The US was very vibrant with this. Um, there was Australia. There was, uh, this, these are many cohort studies where they, they would get, they were retrospectives, they would get files of all the children, put them in cohorts, uh, especially the ones who've gone through hernia, pyloric stenosis, uh, surgery, they've gone through the other one that is most common, apart from hernia, uh, was uh, any uh, mothers who had undergone a general anesthetic during their second trimester and third trimester. And all these, all these children were lumped together and the comparison groups were those children who had not undergone anesthesia. There were some studies that, that were involving twins. So as to show that these children in the same environmental, uh, had the same environmental stimuli financially in the same, I mean, they watched the same programs, they read the same books. And some of them showed that there was a discordance in IQ, in learning disabilities, but some parents mostly would report that the children after having undergone an anesthetic, they were never the same again. For example, they, they were slightly slower. So there was a lot of mixed, uh, mixed results. The children had learning dis uh, disabilities. They were being the IQ was a little bit less. They had uh, behavioral changes, the ones who are investigated in their teenage, they had behavioral changes. And um, all this triggered now very, um, these were progressive studies. That's what came up in the late, uh, later on in the century and early this century, where we started with the PANDA study. This was actually FDA funded. It was large scale multi-site in both about eight hospitals and enrolled children who had undergone, who were undergoing inguinal hernia surgery before three years of age. You remember we said by the time you're three years of age, you formed most of your brain. And they had a sibling comparison group. And what we're going to assess was uh, the neuro neuropsychological assessment. They checked single anesthesia exposure uh, for those children who had it before that six months. Then they checked if there was a sibling within that six months of age who had no anesthesia before 36 months, the ones who are, one is three years, the other one is zero years, within three years separation. And both siblings at that time were between eight and 15 years. When they analyzed, they realized that there was no significant difference in IQ scores between the siblings. Uh, remember siblings grow almost at the same pace, they have the same genes. It's a good comparison. Uh, in twins and in siblings. And the conclusion was healthy young children undergoing short duration, single exposure to GA were not at a major risk for having learning disability and neuropsychological, neurodevelopmental uh, problems, challenges, so to speak. So unlike the previous epidemiological studies, the retrospective, the PANDA study was able to account for variables such as surgery, medical condition, and length of exposure. 
Then came the mask study, that was the Mayo Anesthesia Safety in Kids. This came as there was Mayo 1, Mayo 2, and Mayo 3, where uh, Mayo 1 was looking at, um, I think it was the IQ, then there was the one that was looking at the effects GA, children who've been exposed to GA before three years, they got neuropsychological testing, and then there was Mayo 3 that did ADHD, Association of GA and ADHD. And eventually the whole, the conclusion from this was that anesthesia exposure before three years was not associated with deficits in primary outcome. That's the general intelligence. It wasn't associated with it. Secondary outcomes were suggesting that multiple but not single exposures were associated with a pattern of changes in specific neuropsychological domains that were associated with behavioral and learning difficulties. That is the children who needed two or three anesthetics before they were three years old. Um, they had a bit more problems. Then was the that was most involved in eight countries. Uh, it was comparing regional and general anesthesia for effects of neurodevelopmental outcome and apnea in infants. So they did a randomized controlled study that was the assessors were blinded. It was an equivalent study to just check whether regional and GA were equivalent for these children who needed bilateral or unilateral inguinal hernia repair. And these were between 26 weeks and 60 weeks post conception age. Uh, that's around, uh, around six months. So one group was randomized to have a regional anesthetic, that's a spinal with bifibacin as a single injection, by codol or as a spinal. And these children could have also a codol um, and an ilioinguinal nerve block as, as their pain relief mood. Uh, after they did that, after they did the spinal, the child was only allowed, rather the anesthetist was only allowed to give sucrose to suck on uh, as, a, as a way to placate the kid. For the general anesthetic, these children had a superfluorine, up to 8% for induction and maintenance. For most of these hospitals, they were using or they use superfluorine for maintenance. And there was no opioid, there was no nitrous oxide, it was just oxygen and air. Uh, they did not control for what mode of ventilation, what um, uh, what uh, air we devised to put, the, it was just about the drugs and paracetamol was allowed. They could have a cordial root after induction of the GA or they could have an ilinguinal nerve block. So the, the result they were looking for is one, post-op apnea in these little ones, some of them were premature and two, they were checking, uh, they were checking for neurocognitive and behavioral changes at two and five years of age. So the results were that if you have a G or you have a regional, there is not, there's no difference. But the mid, um, median, no, average, the average time of the general anesthesia in the gas study was 54 minutes. That's generally what we take to have a unilateral hernia repair. And uh, they found that the, the population was predominantly male. So one of the suggestions is that they should have a predominantly female study if, you, if you're going to interrogate this so much. And children uh, who are going to have multiple or prolonged exposure could not be generalized into this because this one was mostly just one study. So after all this, what can we What's, what's next? What's, what can we think of? Yeah. Do we give this GA? Is it good? Is it bad? The non-clinical studies, the animal studies were given super, super large doses when the rats are given 8% of civofluorine for six hours. It's, it's not many surgeries that we do in children that last six hours and you give 6% or four to 6% of civofluorine during that entire time. They, they cannot be generalized and extrapolated to human being, human, uh, human studies. Uh, but in these animals also, there were some changes that were noted with only one hour of exposure. There were some memory losses and behavioral changes. 
So even the conclusion from the non-clinical studies were longer duration, younger patients, multiple procedures were causing a bit more side effects. Then our clinical studies, we had conflicting results for single exposures. Some, those were those uh, retrospective ones which were done. Some researchers were fo uh, found an association with single shot exposures. Others have only found an association with longer or several exposures. I guess it's dose related. It's about time and dose. I mean, if you're going to have a GA that's going to be about six hours, as opposed to a GA that's going to be about four, 40 minutes, we can't, we can't put those children, we can't expect the same results in those children. In any case, most anesthetics in young children are of fairly brief duration. So in summary, at least from where I sit and from looking at all these studies, we cannot really say that learning disabilities, behavioral changes uh, has been caused by anesthesia because whatever caused you to go and give this anesthesia is that there was a problem. Uh, for example, in, uh, there was an article which I should have found and attached from 1890 something that uh, showed a cure for idiocy. Uh, and they showed a photograph of the typical adenoid child who had been, who had had adenoidectomy. Uh, but can you, can you imagine a child who has hypertrophied adenoids, hypertrophied tonsils? You'd consider that child to have learning disabilities whether they have the surgery or not. Now, if they don't have the surgery, they're still going to have learning disabilities. So whatever cause makes this child require multiple anesthetic could be the cause of the learning disability. I know I sound like a lawyer, but um, that's what's there. The child is unwell. They have more frequent hospital visits times, this is associated with sick role. Sick role comes with behavioral change. You're treated differently by society. You treat yourself differently. You expect a bit different from yourself uh, from if you are a normal healthy person. So I don't know. I don't know what everyone else thinks. So um, if you're asked, what are the benefits of this anesthesia and sedation? From where I sit, I would say, uh, the year 2020, I mean, we are, this, the time has gone, as, as we grow with the time or as the ages come, we are benefiting more. I mean, before this, we couldn't, a hernia would be repaired using sacs and nitrous, a tube is put in and the baby's hernia is sorted. In the 50s, it wouldn't until the date of struts. If it was in the 1940s, no, we wouldn't give anesthesia. I mean, there were no were there hypodermic needles then. So I'd say there's a benefit. There's a benefit to the anesthesia and sedation. And uh, pain in itself is neurotoxic. It causes psychological trauma. It causes uh, issues put afterwards. You can't, uh, we can't subject people to pain because we are afraid that they'll have neurotoxic effects. I don't know what you think. Um, Susan, I guess when, when we are all asked what are the side effects of this, I would consider the discussion I would have to put before the period is what's the duration of the surgery? Do we expect to go back after this? And also we cannot dissociate surgery from the anesthesia. And there is, uh, if it boils down to it, we might need to come to be, we might need to be doing our neurocognitive evaluation. Uh, I guess up to now, most people actually ask what's the milestone of the child? Is the child sitting at four months? Uh, are they talking? If they're at one year, if they started standing, we tend to do our own evaluation, whether this child is within normal milestones or not. But um, the ball is in your court. I don't know. I'm finished, Susan. Thank you very much, Dr. Karen Bayer, for that good summary with the updates of the three major studies that have been done to try and answer this question. 
so far, I can see uh, no questions from the chat side. Uh, probably, I will start by asking the question that uh, was among one of your slides. And probably Dr. Rebecca Gray can help us answer this uh, as we wait for anybody else with a question from the chat. So your first slide said, uh, a parent asks you, does this, uh, do these drugs of yours have an effect on the brain? Actually, I had just last week, a young six year old who themselves asked me if uh, their brain is going to be normal after the anesthetic. So Dr. Re Rebecca Gray, how would you answer this question? How do you handle the parent at this point or the child who understands what they're going through? Yeah, sure. That's um, a very, quite a precocious six-year-old you're dealing with there. Um, they're always quite intriguing patients. Um, I, I still find it unusual for people in my practice and parents in my practice to ask me specifically about the neurotoxic effects, but I don't do very much private or any private practice work. Um, and I do believe that my colleagues in private do get asked that periodically. Um, but um, I spend quite a bit of time um, explaining, I mean, you know, a lot of patients and children when they can express it are, are very fearful about, about having anesthesia. So, um, I just spend time going through kind of what they got, what to expect, and then um, talk with them and their parents about the safety measures that we have in place. I mean, when it when it comes down to this neurotoxicity, um, Karen, you covered that so well, um, and especially all the research, which is um, just it's so extensive. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it really that is just such a small part of the potential danger that. Um, brains are under the developing brains are under. We can just we can do so many worse things to the developing brain than give it a drug, um, and we do do that. And that's a problem with a lot of the studies is that like there's no control over uh, so many of the other variables that can affect um, brain perfusion and brain metabolism, etc. So I think what those studies do show is that whatever effect it is. That drugs themselves have, if it is a significant, you know, it's it's not it, it sort of pales into significance compared to all the other potential effects. So really, if you are doing the absolutely perfect anaesthetic, then maybe your choice of drugs starts to to play a role. But you know, that's not always something that parents can really appreciate. They, um, you know, the drugs themselves seem to be all that we do is we just give drugs and then sit back. <laughs> so <laughs> it's quite hard to give them the nuances of what we put into, um, into giving an anesthetic. Um, so yeah, so to answer your question, I, I really harp on about the, the safety and how safe anesthetics have become. You know, a lot of people have got a very historic perspective on anesthesia and this concept of someone dying under an anesthetic and so on. So yeah, so that's, that's really my, my approach. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rebecca. Thank you. Um, Dr. Karen, there's a question here from Dr. Kevin Umani, who's asking about children who come for multiple stage surgeries, such as a uh, teratology of fallow requiring a BT shunt in pulmonary atresia, for example, then later come for definitive repair in six months. Are they at risk of brain disturbance? is the question. Children who come from multiple um, surgeries, especially at a young age. So um, I would, uh, if the parent asked me, I would say such problems. I know I sound like a politician, but such a child already has so many problems uh, affecting them. I don't think my anesthesia agents per se will just be, um, you know, the way a tree is being axed using uh, with 10 strikes, then the last two fell it. And then those are the people who are branded the heroes of the tree felling. I guess you're having tetralogy of fallow, you're having cardiac surgery, you're having cardiac anesthesia, you're having bypass, you're having post-op in ICU, which is staged. Even as we say anesthesia is a causative 
of neurodevelopmental delay, learning disabilities, and behavioral changes later, we cannot ignore the pathology that brought this child to the theater in the first place, not once, not twice. Sorry, am I muted? Yes, you had muted towards the end when you're saying had... not twice, sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. So, uh, I, so what I would say is that the pathology has already predisposed this child onto the left side of the graph in IQ and learning disabilities. Uh, so my response would be very political, so to speak, but my message would be that Anesthesia would be a very small, the risk of anesthesia causing learning disabilities in this child would be one of 10 factors. But yes, there's a risk. It's been shown that longer duration of surgery, rather longer duration of anesthesia and um, more frequent and in a younger patient would affect this child. Thank you, Dr. Mbaya. Um, Dr. Maraka, she has also said that for such children with cyanotic heart disease, there are also other confounding issues like you've mentioned and that the fact that chronic cyanosis is already a problem in itself. Um, another question here from the audience, um, from Alfred Nyandes is asking, for children who have um, in, in comparison of regional and general anesthesia for uh, procedures below the umbilicus, what would be the preferred or what would be the better suited anesthe um, anesthetic to give, general or regional? Um, I'll answer that, but I would like uh, Susan, Dr. Gatuya, and uh, Dr. Rebecca to all pitch in something so that it doesn't sound so one-sided. But from my end, uh, first depends on the age of the child. Um, we've had six-year-olds, as you've, you've heard from Susan, precocious children who are discussing their options in anesthesia, whether they would like, uh, some of them say, I'm so afraid of being dead, I would rather be awake. And that's when I had the youngest spinal I've done is in a seven-year-old who said he would rather be awake. And we put him awake. And he nicked a bit during the spinal, but he enjoyed the surgery. There was a scream, yes, but he said he, if he was to choose again, he would choose to have a regional anesthetic. But come to the younger children. I think um, the gas study showed that they are almost equivalent, so to speak. And then I would say, do what you're most comfortable with, with less suffering to the patient. I don't know if that's to say anything. Susan, you can. Yes, okay, thank you, Karen, for inviting me to answer this. I'm actually uh, very interested in neuroaxial anesthesia in children. Yes, I would say, as Karen says, again, neuroaxial anesthesia in children is not um, tea and uh, bread and butter for everybody. So ask yourself, are you in a position to do this without causing uh, harm to the child? You can still do neuro, I mean, regional anesthesia, neuro anesthesia, even at the youngest. I, I personally do a lot of uh, preterm uh, caudals and spinals for short procedures like hernias. Uh, under regional, under purely regional anesthesia, and it works well. Uh, actually, uh, there's a lot of move, uh, even to the one-year-olds and two-year-olds, doing uh, the below umbilical uh, procedures just under spinal anesthesia. Uh, a colleague from the Texas Children Hospital actually has a very big practice with the children between infants, those, those are children below one year who undergo these short procedures just purely under spinal anesthesia. And uh, they have published papers showing very good outcomes. So again, as uh, Dr. Uh, Karen says, it is an option. Where you are options, where the patient, do you, can you handle it? Is the patient safe? 
discuss with the parents the option. If the child is uh, at the edge of discussing their options, then let them in. And yes, you can actually go ahead and do this uh, without having to give the children uh, general anesthesia. But again, uh, as uh, the GAS study showed, our worries about anesthetics in short procedures are not too much. So if the child is going to be uncomfortable, do not push to give uh, regional anesthesia. Thank you. So I can ask the Dr. Gaduya. Uh, there's a question uh, from uh, Bill Kigathi, who is asking, what are your thoughts uh, on general anesthesia for what would appear to be minor, e.g. facial cuts, tongue ties? Uh, how do you assure the parents anxiety when the object of the general anesthesia being too much for the child? Yeah, I, I guess he's saying uh, parents sometimes get shocked when you tell them this child is going for a general anesthetic just for a little cut on the face. Uh, do you think that is too much of an anesthetic and how do you handle these particular patients? Dr. Zipora Gaduya. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Okay, okay good. Uh, thank you very much for asking me to be part of the panelists and asking that question. I think one of the things that we need to do as uh, people who give anesthesia to children is without demeaning anybody, educate the surgeons and the other caregivers because the aspect of a little anesthesia or a little procedure I've actually found in uh, pediatric anesthesia is a fallacy. Because especially when you're going to do a procedure in the mouth, like a tongue tie release, sometimes it might be simple and sometimes you may lose the airway at the same aspect. So, and when the surgeon tells the, the parents that this is going to be a very short procedure, and we've seen even INDs in small babies turning tragic. So I think we need to reach a level where we allow ourselves to discuss the uh, details of anesthesia with the parents and also educate our other caregivers, especially the surgeons, that there is nothing like a small anesthetic or a minor procedure that is requiring a general anesthetic because a general anesthetic is a general anesthetic and has all the subsequent complications that can come. So, I think the important thing is to make that those parents understand that the operation is going to be in the mouth, let's say like for a tongue tie release here, and that the patient will be asleep or for not feeling pain, or even if they're going to do it at the local, they still need that chance to infiltrate the local and then they are going to cut and they may, there may be some bleeding and all those things can complicate the airway and the subsequent complications must be well understood. And I think once the parents, I find that once the parents understand why you want to do what you want to do, then they are more receptive as opposed to when they don't know why you need to, to do what you're telling them you have to do. So I think uh, with that, I think I've said a lot, but in a nutshell, the important thing is to all discuss as a team and to know what we are doing. And for shared airway, I think it is important that we appreciate the risk of losing the airway in these small children. I also want to comment on something about uh, regional anesthesia and children, and we've talked about it before. Like Susan has said, if you're comfortable uh, with it, then it is good. You can go ahead and do it. If you're not uh, very comfortable and you think you want to sedate or even put the child at a general anesthesia to achieve your regional anesthesia, and then you can wake up the child when you think your regional anesthesia is working well, that also reduces the, the length of exposure to the general anesthetic and when you think about how the brain develops, uh, at what level the insult is happening, 
then you, you want to be to be careful about uh, your anesthetic and yet you if you have to do it then you have to do it because we don't want to put back our children to where it was uh, proposed that they don't even feel pain uh, when you think about neurogenesis all the way to myelination and the whole cycle then you need to know at what point you are at and why is it necessary to do the surgery or to give the anesthetic that you're giving at that time if it's something that you cannot delay then i think we shouldn't kill ourselves that we are killing the brain if the pathology would not wait for you to fully develop the brain and and move forward so i think it is important to know at what point we are at in that development and of course with this when you see so many studies, it means a lot of things are still not understood. People are talking about the neuroprotective uh, effects of uh, DEXM. We don't know whether it will turn out to be the next big thing that we can use to protect these brains of children. We just have to watch the space and see uh, what, what will come out of it. But my take is that if children need anesthesia, then give them. Uh, in the best way possible. We're minimizing the exposure, but maximizing the, the positive effects of the anesthesia. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Dr. Gaduya. Um, Dr. Gray, maybe I'll ask this question to you from Dr. Patrick Olang. He's asking, what is the risk of, to the unborn baby of giving general anesthesia for cesarean delivery? <laughs> You're asking the question. <laughs> he hasn't done a Caesar for 20 years. Um, <laughs> but um, well, the most obvious one that comes to mind is obviously any opiates that have been used. That's um, and um, from from what I recall, we would often be very um, careful with all of that until the baby had been out. You know, the Caesar, the amount of exposure that the baby gets in the seizures of the Caesar is obviously quite small because you know normally if you're doing a general anaesthetic, that would be a, a fairly, fairly rapid delivery of, of the baby. Um, but I think um, when you're talking about um, if you're operating on the mother, say in the second or third trimester or in the first trimester, that's obviously something quite different. And I'm really racking my brain on this. Um, and I welcome anyone who's doing this and will come and I do remember benzodiazepines being one thing that we had to be careful with. Um, you know, if one was doing a general anesthetic. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> sorry, I'm not going to be able to answer that question very well. No worries. Thank you for that. I hope Dr. Olang is um, satisfied with that answer. But maybe Dr. Karen Bayer. Sorry, I got a question um, uh, directly to me uh, from one of the uh, fellow students asking, you've talked about the effects on the um, term baby. What about the effects on the premature interim, um, or the premature infant? Um, would it be a bit different? Would it be more or less the same? Um, sorry, the gas study seems to be the most uh, recent fashionable to talk about right now. They did this in 26 week old babies. I think that's as preterm as it gets. Actually, I think a 26 week old in Kenya has I don't know, I, I can't even say it out aloud, the chances of their survival here, uh, much less going in for inguinal hernia repair. Um, and from 26 weeks old to 60 weeks post conceptual age. So those are also, I mean, preterm, they could be preterm babies who are now at 60 weeks or 46 weeks or, but they went in for surgery, randomized to GA and regional anesthetic. Uh, where they looked at both post-op apnea, which is a main risk that we are, we all dread in these little ones, the preterms in the first 24 hours. And then they looked at the neuropsychological, the neurodevelopmental at two years and at five years. And it was equivalent, having a GA or having a regional. Now, I cannot speak on the equivalence of having a GA and not having one in a premature baby, knowing what I knew. But if they need a GA 
the other hernia, which might obstruct, especially in PREMS, the hernia has to be repaired. It needs to be done. So uh, we also know that the brain develops most from 28 weeks up to when they are 24 months. That's when all the myelination is happening. That's when all the synapses are forming. That's when all the glials are becoming nice and fat. That's when the brain is adding weight. And if we give something that's going to abort this process, even for a day or two, or that's going to speed up the death of neurons that were not planning to die, then we are doing something that is adverse. But pack that and put something else in bracket. If this child is going to die if they do not have anesthesia, or they have these adenoids that are causing them hypoxia, or they have this cyanotic heart disease that needs to be repaired, we have to repair it. So it's a case by case. But of, yes, all these studies, they have a common consensus that more premature brains, even in the rats and in the little guinea pigs, were more sensitive to the uh, negative effects of general anesthesia. I don't know if that has answered your question. Thank you. I believe that should give him some reprieve to the answer. Um, a question, uh, maybe Dr. Nabulindo, <laughs> I can ask you. Um, Elias has asked, a 10 day old scheduled for phimosis repair, is it okay to postpone the surgery till the child is older? Uh, thank you very much, Sally. Um, again, uh, what uh, the other panelists have uh, talked about is uh, the importance of discussing with the team, that is the surgical team and the parents on the need to do this surgery at this particular time. So the studies we have are uh, showing short uh, surgeries do not cause a lot of harm. A bit of uh, conflicting studies still showing, very few of them showing that even short procedures might have harm. So my way of uh, looking at this would be, whenever you have a child in the period which has been put as three years, below three years, who requires surgery, then the question comes, uh, as uh, Dr. Mbaya said, discuss with the surgical team is this really necessary to be done right now, especially if they are still in the neonatal period? Can it wait? If it can't wait, then, and it has to be done for the sake of the child's uh, health, then you as the anesthetist has to make sure that uh, you're doing everything possible to reduce the exposure of the child to the general anesthetics. Uh, then two, Again, confounding factors, apart from the general anesthetics, make sure that we, the issues of hypotension, hypoxia, which can also be quite big confounding factors in this particular group of uh, patients is taken care of. Uh, then if you are having children who might require multiple surgeries, again, discussion with the surgical team, how can we reduce the number of times this child will have to come for a general anesthetic? I'll give a, uh, an example of if you have a child who has a hernia and uh, an undescended testis, then the parents are requesting for a circumcision. Do they need to come to three exposures of general anesthesia or can this be discussed and be done either with one or two uh, general anesthetics? So those discussions uh, need to start coming up. What is important again is uh, that some of the societies like the American Society of Anesthesiologists requires you as an anesthetic, anesthetist to actually discuss this particular part uh, of the possible harm of anesthesia with parents of all children under the age of three. So if the parent doesn't ask, you still required to discuss with the, this with the parents and allay their fears. Again, this came after the FDA put out uh, that uh, precautionary measure on the level of the drugs that uh, people should be aware that an aesthetic might, might cause harm. So discussing with the parents, discussing with the surgical team, and uh, making a decision that is best uh, for the child, especially the younger the brain, then the more discussions uh, you should have, knowing what we know about the changes that might happen uh, in the brain. 
Uh, maybe just to chip in the question of uh, Dr. Lang about GA in the pregnant uh, woman. Uh, studies were done, the animals, some of the animal studies actually had uh, pregnant uh, rats exposed to general anesthetic and they looked at effects on the newborn babies and the effects on the brain were the same as uh, when the GA is given to the child themselves directly. So again, it's still, uh, I mean, most studies will probably be needed in human uh, beings to show if uh, that is a big part of a concern. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nabolindo, for that. Um, this is a sec the second part of the question from Dr. Bill um, Kivagi, who is asking, maybe Dr. Rebecca Gray and Dr. Gaduya, you can answer, what are your counseling points sometimes when you get children with pre-existing neurodisabilities who require surgery? And how is it that, you know, the children already have um, an existing insult um, or disturbance? And now how do you uh, relieve anxiety or for the parents to assure them that yes, this child needs the surgery? So what are your counseling points? Um, okay, so my initial feeling when I have a child like that is these children carry an increased risk. They've got, um, and um, you know, obviously my anesthetic is going to be, I'm not gonna be sitting back and doing the crossword on this one. Um, not that I ever do that, of course. But um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so, so I will definitely spend time and there's a balance between, you know, allaying their anxiety, but also keeping them well informed and um, not uh, making them feel as though this, this is a procedure that carries no risk at all. And that's quite a fine line to tread. And definitely one needs to get a sense of the parents. Um, I've actually spoken previously about parental anxiety um, around uh, anesthesia and how you deal with parents and different parents cope in different ways, um, which is a very long way to answer the question, but some parents need a lot of information and that will alleviate their anxiety and other parents want as little information as possible and they want just to know that you're going to do your best job, that you're on your game and, and that you are aware of safety issues and so on. So trying to get a sense uh, of, and, and if you pick the wrong approach for the wrong patient, you send them in the, in the opposite direction. So the parents that need information, if you try and fob them off with very little, that's very unreassuring. The parents that don't want information, if you give them a lot, it makes them more anxious. Um, so what, if I was gonna try and kind of keep it um, tight, I would say uh, your child, uh, I would, you know, obviously those patients often have a lot of other risk factors that go with them around chest, um, how their chest is and, and what, um, you know, sort of swallowing and things like that, which can really impact on their risk perioperatively. Um, you may have decided that they're going to need an ICU bed postoperatively or a high care bed um, and sort of tailor it according to that. So if they're sick enough to need those sort of things, um, I'm going to say, um, I'm going to look after your child very, very carefully during this operation. I'm going to um, be uh, working hard to keep their lungs uh, and heart healthy, uh, to make sure that, um, you know, that the surgery is able to proceed. Um, and uh, the anesthetic that I give will be the best uh, anesthetic for your child. Um, I'm going to, goodness, uh, make sure that um, I'm going to be paying great attention uh, to safety um, during during this procedure. And I, I would just basically continue to reassure in that way. Um, I, I, yeah, so, so really, I mean, with those kind of anesthetics, I mean, that's the bottom line is just paying meticulous attention to every little detail. And that at the end of the day is far more important than what you give, but that, um, that's quite hard. You can't sort of um, take the parents through four years of anesthesia training and six years of medicine training in your preoperative visit to communicate what, um, quite how much attention to detail you're gonna be paying. Um, but a lot of it is also uh, for me um, around showing, uh, showing a calm confidence. Um, yeah. Um, Zippy, I'm sure you've got a, a good approach on that one. Okay, uh, thank you, Rebecca. 
I also think that, especially for patient, for parents who have chronically ill patients with uh, neurodevelopmental issues, the one thing that I find works well when you're trying to establish rapport is to assure them that you appreciate that they are the ones who know their child better than you do. So you listen, you listen carefully to what they have to say and uh, form your answers depending on what they tell you. And some of them have long stories, especially if they've had previous anesthetics that you are not part of, they may want to give you a lot of details about those previous anesthetics. They will tell you about what happened. Uh, some may not be uh, very pleasant, but just listen. For the ones who require a lot of uh, attention, what I have found is for these patients, they're not the patients you want to go and see when you're in a hurry or when you're tired or when you have something on your mind, because sometimes they can really uh, take a lot, of your, a lot of your energy and you really need to give them that time. What I have found helps sometimes is an assurance that the drugs you're using are safe because they have concerns that the drugs that you're using may make the condition of their child worse. So that assurance that the drugs you're using are safe is good. They also have concerns about uh, drug interactions, especially for the ones who have been on chronic drugs like anti-seizure medicine. They want to know that those drugs will not uh, overreact. Some of them feel, oh, when I give my child the anticonvulsants, they sleep for long. And now you're saying you're going to give them something else to make them sleep? Will, they, will it make them oversleep? And all those assurances that you want to give them. So um, the fact that you explain to them, like I said, the most important thing is for you and the child and the parents to be on the same cover, that they understand where you're coming from, what you're doing, and what you intend to do. So, sorry about that. So we, we want to ask them to, to be on the same page with you. And I think when you counsel parents for those procedures, especially if they've had multiple procedures which you were not part of, and then now you're part of that procedure, it can be quite time consuming. But once you have dealt with a family once, twice, you basically understand each other and you know where you're going. It becomes easier for subsequent uh, encounters that you have with them. I don't know whether Rebecca wants to add anything else. No, I think Zippy, that is just, you've, I, I, you're so wise. I love that approach. It is so important to listen to the families um, in these places. And um, as you say, in these cases, you know, one can be quite tempted to kind of hurry them along. Um, but by listening to them, you know, these cases can be so difficult to, to put to sleep. And when they wake up, you can't work out if they're in pain or if, if this is their normal uh, way of being. So spending time with the parents and understanding what those children are like is, is absolutely key. And, I mean, in terms of the drugs um, and the, yeah, I, I mean, I don't have anything else to say about the drugs with those, with those kids. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, I think there are two more questions. Uh, Alfred Nyasende asking about additives you can use in regional anesthesia and Dr. Miruri asking about uh, hypothermia in children. Uh, kindly allow us not to handle those ones. These are topics uh, that can be discussed another time or Alfred and Dr. Miruri, you are free to privately chat with any of the presenters so that we keep to the topic of today. Uh, so because we are 10 minutes past 10, we still have the presentation from our sponsors. I'll just go around the presenters and the panelists to give us um, their last comments before we have a short presentation from our sponsors. 
So I'll start uh, with you, Dr. Karen Bayer. What would you wrap this in a one minute uh, sentence? You can unmute yourself, Karen. In one sentence about safety uh, in anesthesia, safety for the pediatric patient, I would still reassure the parent that um, anesthesia, anesthesia exposure is not, is not dangerous. Those are the words I would say. I wouldn't say is safe, but it's not dangerous, but um, it wouldn't have very, it wouldn't have significant uh, insult on your child compared to the pathology that's bringing the child to theater. And by and large, I just tell my parents, uh, my patients, I'm glad in the year 2020, we can sort what you have uh, by making your child pain-free, comfortable, and you're comfortable and you're not hearing your, your little child screaming and everything has a side effect, but this one has small side effects. I think hearing your baby scream of pain as they're being circumcised or any repair is worse. Maybe I trivialize it. I don't know, but I'm glad I'm in the year 2020. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Karen. Uh, Dr. Zipora Gaduya, you are closing comments. Okay, uh, thank you, Suzanne. I think uh, we need to put the message forth that if anesthesia needs to be given, then it should be given uh, safely. When you have smaller children, of course, the issue of uh, who gives the anesthetic, we say the senior most, most experienced person is going to handle the anesthetic and assure them that as per the knowledge that we have now, this is the best thing that we can do for your child. Because when, when details come later and uh, science has changed, then we may, we may find ourselves at a loss. But as of what we know now, this is the best thing that we can do for your child. Uh, let's not be scared of giving anesthesia to children because of this issue about brain development. Let us just do it to the best of our ability to the best of the knowledge that we have now and to the best of sorting out the pathology that has brought the child to hospital, but also having a sensitive ear to listen and understand the concerns that the parents and the caregivers have and the older children, and also to continuously read and understand what is it that is emerging every day. Is there anything new that we can do to make this anesthetic for the smaller children, especially the neonates, the premature neonates, the very young, uh, make it safer to the best of our knowledge. But as of now, I would say, this, despite the very rigorous discussion about the effects of anesthesia on the developing brain, it is important for us to do what we have evidence of right now. And that is that it is safer to give anesthetic and shorter exposures may not be dangerous to the brain. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Rebecca Gray. Yeah, I would echo what uh, both Karen and, and Zippy have said. Um, I want to just bring your attention to another, I mean, these. The papers just keep coming um, on this topic and they will, it's such a, you know, it's it's something that freaks everyone out. So in ANA, an anesthesia and analgesia in, in September this year, there was an, a refocus on this with two very good editorials, if you can access those. But this was around a paper that showed an increased incidence of ADHD in children who'd had uh, a single exposure under the age of five to, to surgery. And there are various reasons, and this is a retrospective uh, study, so various reasons why this um, shouldn't alter the way we do things currently, but just to keep that in mind that those sort of questions are going to be coming um, to you uh, again. So very important to emphasize that we don't do surgery willy-nilly. 
surgery is done if it's indicated and for no other reason, um, and uh, surgery that can be postponed um, safely without consequence to the child um, should be postponed till, till after the age of three. It, it would it say two initially, but three definitely does seem to be a much more sensible age to choose. Uh, so yeah, so good good teamwork with your surgeons so that you're all on the same page, and that way you can really reassure the patient that uh, the, the parents that um, that the surgery is the right way to go. Uh, and I go so far as to say, if this is my child, this is what I would do. Yeah. So thank you very much uh, for that wonderful presentation, Dr. Karen Bayer. A lot of participants have also say a great presentation on the chat. And uh, at this point, I would uh, like to thank also Dr. Zipporah Gadwe and Rebecca Gray for uh, accepting to be our panelists and answering the questions. And I'm um, proud to say uh, Dr. Karen Bayer, Dr. Zipporah Gadwe and Rebecca Gray are all, can I say, alumni of Red Cross. Uh, War Memorial Children's Hospital in South Africa. <laughs> yeah, so they all know each other and they have all worked together in that busy children's hospital. Thank you very much. Uh, without further ado, I would like to, for the remaining 15 minutes, to invite uh, the representative for our sponsors. Uh, Frederick is a representative of Italian Prefilled uh, Syringes. He's going to talk to us about uh, the topic on the safety of pre-filled syringes. So we can see your slide, uh, Fred. Uh, Thank you. You can go ahead. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes, I can. OK, thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'll be very brief. and. Uh, I want to introduce a company called Agatant. Agatant is a French company that uh, is uh, domiciled in uh, Lyon and uh, it specializes in making prefilled syringes. So that's what I want to talk about, the benefits of these and the safety in anesthesia. Okay. So the context is, uh, you can see there, uh, we are moving, uh, we are trying to change from drawing, mixing, and an inspiration of, uh, uh, of, 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 of drugs from such small uh, syringe, uh, vials or glass samples, because we have to acknowledge that glass samples are widely used in packaging of injectable, drugs and millions are drawn up and there comes a risk of that. So let's see what kind of risk we are talking about. Also, there are five risk areas that I look at when I want to talk about the safety of what the prefilled syringes will offer. Uh, risk of error, risk of infection, uh, injecting glass uh, micro fragments, risk of injury, as well as risk of delay in treatment. Okay, so uh, again, I just want to mention the five rights in what we consider as uh, in drug ad administration, that is right drug, dose, patient, time, and route. Uh, again, you do not want hospitals maybe hazardous to your health if any of those fives or multiple of those are wrong, like you can see in the picture to your right. right. So risk of error, uh, error of, uh, we do have uh, uh, error of selection, dilution, and uh, lack or, of, of identification. If you just have uh, drawn up uh, syringes, not well labeled, as we'll see in the next few slides, that can uh, lead to an error because, yes. And then given that we are now working in an environment, a COVID environment, where in the emergency room or operating room, uh, there could be restriction of staff if you are dealing with a COVID patient. Uh, you could imagine, because if somebody, if you, maybe you, I know you can make, you can prepare your, 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 your dilutions prior, 
but in the emergency setup, you never know. You might run out, you may need more, or you might, yes. So things can turn differently that can challenge that, yes. So about 50%, uh, do, uh, according to this uh, review in uh, Australia, 50.4% uh, due to syringe and drug preparation errors, 18%, 18.9 of, uh, of it is uh, syringe swap, 20.8 is on the selection of the wrong ample or drug labeling error. So risk of medication error is 70 times greater when prepared by hand. Uh, as you can see here in this medical environment, uh, the question is to, to the right, one of these things is not like the other. I do not know whether you can spot it immediately, if you can quickly, and also to the right, can you spot it quickly? And in during uh, an emergency setup and, uh, you know, the, the, the moment can really challenge your selection and you might have that as a, so an analysis sometimes do not label or inappropriately label the syringes that they, they, they're prepared. That's another risk of error. So another, the risk of infection is also there. We know that uh, uh, accepting methods for preparing uh, intravenous drugs are there, but how many times do there is there a violation to the uh, set procedures on how to remain aseptic in the hospital? So we know that even hand wash, look at it in the COVID environment right now. Uh, how many times do we wash our hands or should we remember to wash after maybe touching certain surfaces? Yet you've been reminded of that. Okay, for the healthcare professionals, uh, it's a much more di uh, different environment. And uh, because the rules might be there, yes, but uh, at least one deviation from a septic technique was observed among 100%, 58%, and 19% of cases during an, uh, an audit in UK, Germany, and France. And one out of every 25 inpatient, 4%, in the US acute care hospital acquire, acquires at least one healthcare associated infection. So there is risk of infection, not only to, um, not only to the patient, but also to the healthcare professional. Microorganism with the potential to cause infection were isolated in 19 out of 300 cases. That is according to that study. So let's look at the risk of injecting glass, uh, glass microparticles, sorry. Uh, yes, the infusion of glass microparticle may result into in pulmonary sil silicosis, nodular fib fibrosis of the liver, spleen, and the small bowel. So as you break the picture there, you can see you were not sure whether everything, what small tiny particles might get in there. Okay, what about the risk of injury? Okay, 26% of anesthesiologists has scars on their hand from opening glass samples. I do not know whether that is a true picture with, uh, with the audience who are practicing and more than 2 million uh, needle, needle stick injury while you're trying to draw your drug, dilute, prepare and label. So, so the skin lesion can, rep uh, can represent a high infection risk as they may be gateway to for bacterial viruses such as hepatitis B and C and HIV infection. So how cost effective, uh, cost effective element of the uh, prefilled syringes. One of the, um, it, the, there is, of course, there's the wastage that uh, one estimate that the average drug wastage cost per case of almost $15. And the drug waste could also represent more than 25% of hospital anesthesia drug budget. If you look at it, not everything that is drawn up which was meant to be uh, used, is used. Some are discarded after dilution. Another aspect is what is the shelf life of the drawn up, diluted, prepared medication. 
So that is also something that can be uh, related to wastage and, uh, and, and it can lead into higher costs. So that does not fit well in the cost effectiveness. So in, in terms of uh, waste disposal, again, remember the needles, the, because for you to draw the needle, the synergies that you've used, they have to be either incinerated or they have to be given to some hazardous waste uh, management organization and the, that cost money. Okay. <clears throat> so the, when we're still at the cost effectiveness that even minor intraoperative incident, including drug error are associated with longer hospital stay and increased cost. So you don't want to have the case where that happens. And uh, I've, I can show a case there, which was in the NHS, the biggest uh, payout of 24 million uh, to great uh, that happened when there was a swap in the, and there's a swap of medication in the operating room. So this is the largest payout in case of medical uh, neglect in uh, operating room. So let's come still to the cost effectiveness of the pre-filled syringes compared to the, the drawn up uh, 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 glass samples. What is normally visible at the top is normally just the cost of the glass sample. I know the cost is, is very, uh, they're actually inexpensive, uh, quite affordable, uh, but that is really not what the cost is. If you look at, because uh, what will be visible for you will be probably the, the drug in the glass sample, also, also the needle, the synergy swabs, diluent antiseptic solutions, and the, maybe the label. That is what probably will be visible. What is not visible, which is indirect cost, is the labor time. Somebody I was employed in the hospital to be able to do this, uh, prior to an operation, a procedure, uh, and that person is paid salary. Uh, he's a human resource. He has a lot of cost. Uh, the other cost is uh, the cost of wastage, disposal, and work-related accidents, just as I've, as I've mentioned, the finger pricks and needle pricks and all that, and the medication error and uh, claim of damage and litigations, just as I've sh shown in that case. So the indirect cost is what is born when we transition from a glass sample into a prefilled syringe. You bear this. So this is what it does when you introduce a, a, a prefilled syringe, that all that cost is, is borne by the, the, the industry, the pharmaceutical industry. So yours is just, you, you have your medicine ready, ready to go and safe. Okay. So let me just touch a few, some of the uh, product benefits of the pre-filled syringes. They save time. They de decrease time between acute episode and drug administration. Therefore, the healthcare professional can have more time with the patients managing that acute episode. The prefacing reduces preparation time at least by 50%. So less risk of medication error as uh, will be seen. Reduction of contamination, especially in the COVID time where if you are to do this, you that you risk of, your risk of exposure increases if you are too many people uh, to be in a, maybe an ICU set up, maybe dealing with a COVID patient and you don't want so many staff in that room, probably you want a fewer people, you want to expose few as possible. There are also limitations of the PPEs. So the, the constraints of resources uh, also is there. So no glass uh, microparticle, there's the sterility and reduction of waste and eco-friendly if you, they're made in uh, recyclable uh, plastic, okay? Reduction of injury to the SCP, we've seen there the needle pricks, the, 24, the, the, the uh, scars and the risk of that lesion. And then the cost effective, which I've just mentioned that uh, the task has shifted to the industry uh, to be able to bear these costs so that the hospital can then, the healthcare professional within the hospital do, don't have to uh, worry about employing 
somebody, a nurse or an AA to be able to do this. So those are the benefits. And as I mentioned, it's a task, task shifting uh, where the industry in the production line is taking over what would have uh, been done in an operating room, in an emergency room, or in a pre-hospital emergency care. Okay. So let's see what products that we have at Agitant and uh, some of the features that, uh, uh, yes. So we have, it is, we, the products are packed in a polypropylene uh, uh, syringe and it's safe and secure. And you can see it's, uh, it's also sterile with a clear labeling and um, it, it, it's quick. Use, its use is very quick. You get it and you're able to, you can see that it's latex free. So it doesn't have any immuno, it doesn't provoke any immunogenicity and uh, individual transparent sterile blister. So that's basically that's what, what it is. So some of the areas have been patented, like uh, I've shown there, uh, on the plunger and the stopper, which is a bar, right bar, and also on the barrel and the tip cap. So that, yeah, and you can see the technology that has gone into uh, doing this. So that's why if I tell you adrenaline, my adrenaline will cost you probably 10 to uh, 10 or more times than the glass sample. That is what has gone into the technology of bringing you a safe serial. Yes. So just to the takeaway message, of course, is that uh, agitant uh, prefilled syringes contributes to the compliance to the five hours in terms of we have the right drug in the right dose for the right patients. And uh, of course, we've made it to be given intravenously and uh, also with lesser right time, it's easier to administer. So we are very much part of uh, that essential need, which is to manage critical situation in the context of safety. So just to show you some of the products, I'll not go into the details of the product, just to just to mention some of the products that we have in the prefilled syringes in Kenya. This is adrenaline, and uh, you can see the, the way it's packed there, sorry. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a 24 month, if once you don't open the pouch, the aluminum pouch, and then uh, once you do that, then it, it used to be used within uh, within 24 hours. Uh, again, the dilution is one to 10,000. So it's one milligram in 10 ml. And um, of course it's stored in aluminum pouch to be protected from light and oxygen. And do not open the aluminum pouch until you're ready to use and do not freeze. And again, our products are sulfite free, latex free. Sulfite is a common preservative in uh, pharmaceutical and, 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 and in food, uh, which some patients can find, can react to, or can elicit immuno, immunogenicity. So uh, the feature of the, the syringe in, in the adrenaline as gain, as just as, as mentioned, it is light, strong, and resistant because it's hard. It's a polypropylene, okay? The aluminum sleeve, and then look at the labeling. It's very much clear, dual labeling, and, and uh, it also does not need, you, you can actually draw, it has a, a standard Lua lock uh, connection. So you don't need a needle. You can actually just connect it directly to the cannula. And then uh, the preservatives, yes, it's free of those. And then it's have a assembled, uh, yes. So of course, in a life-threatening emergency, every minute count, uh, uh, epinephrine, prefilled syringe saves, saves precious time for cardiac arrest. Probably the resuscitation decreases, uh, decreases, of, uh, decreases of 4% with each lapse minute that is uh, reported in that study and in prophylaxis in an, 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 an anaphylaxis the epinephrine administration uh, time determines the prognosis delayed administration of adrenaline is associated with increased morbidity and mortality so so another product that we have that is also in a prefilled syringe is atropine 
we have it in 0 0.5 milligram per five ml and also in one milligram per five ml. We do, in the country, we don't have the three milligram uh, in 10 ml, which is a military grade uh, 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 strength. So that's, uh, that's, that's atropine. And um, of course, we know that uh, uh, the guidelines, the resuscitation guidelines of 2015, uh, the first dose uh, in bradycardia should be 0 0.5 milligram IV. I know in our country we have 0 0.6 uh, milligram per ml. That's what came first. But if uh, I refer you to the guidelines, you will see that a 0 0.5, which I've just said, because it's 0 0.5 milligram uh, per 5 ml, or uh, uh, so you can easily just, that's enough. You can use that. So let's go to another product, which is uh, phenylephrine. We also have this, that is uh, um, phenylephrine in 500 microgram per ml or 500 in 10 ml uh, micrograms. So that is also available in the country. And the labeling is very clear. Uh, let's look at also ephedrine. We also have ephedrine, which is at three milligram per ml or 30 milligram in uh, 10 ml. So these are the products that we have in the prefill syringe in the country. I'm not going to spend time to differentiate when to what to use when, and which is part of the slide. And uh, I just want to say that these products are available in your hospitals. At Nairobi Hospital, they have them. Uh, Cost General has uh, phenylephrine. Uh, Gertrude's have phenylephrine. Um, um, Premier, Premier Hospital in Mombasa has have adrenaline. If, and the phenylephrine, KU referral uh, has phenylephrine, uh, AMREF, they also have uh, adrenaline for pre-hospital emergency care. So these things are, uh, these products are available and uh, even the Nairobi South Hospital has uh, ephedrine and phenylephrine. So for the purpose of time, I want to stop there and another time I'll get then, we'll then go into the product differentiation. Yes. So thank you so much, Suzanne. Yeah, thank you very much, Fred, uh, for that educative presentation. And a few comments for you from the chat, um, which I believe you can see. Dr. Kaiser says uh, she's looking for EpiPen available in Kenya, but you have said the, uh, the adrenaline uh, prefilled syringe is uh, available. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, ours is only to be used within the hospital setup. Mm. Uh, EpiPen can be used, will be used outside to, especially to children who are, uh, you know, who could have, uh, you know, anaphylactic reaction and which can be very bad, you know. So uh, thank you very much uh, to everybody for giving us your time and for the good discussions and questions asked. Um, there was one person who addressed their hand, Angelina Munavu. Uh, I do not know if you still want to say something. I can see your hand still raised. Uh -huh. If uh, Angelina Munavu is there, your hand is raised, we can give you a minute before we close. Or otherwise, then we can close. I've given you permission to unmute yourself, but I can't see you yet. Okay. Okay, good. So I will take that as a, a hand that was raised by mistake. So thank you very much. And uh, for those who are asking where to find the presentation, uh, presentation is available on the YouTube channel. If you just search uh, KSA YouTube uh, channel, you'll get it. And also on our website, uh, Kenya Society of Anesthesiologists uh, website. Uh, if you go there, you're going to get this presentation and uh, many of the other presentations that we've had before. So for just your planning, we still have three more CMEs at the same time on Thursdays for this year. So we shall finish our CMEs for this year uh, on 26th of November. So we still uh, welcome you to attend. So 
So for the uh, doctors, your CME, uh, your CPD points will be sent to you for the clinical officers and the nurses. Again, our administrator will process uh, the certificates for you to get your points from your various regulatory bodies. Uh, that depends on if you attended uh, for the required uh, period of time. So with that, I would like to say thank you very much. And uh, we continue uh, sharing knowledge and I wish you a good evening.